السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of them and to bless every single one of us as well. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open the doors of goodness for every single one of us. And we commence with a prayer for those families and those who have been affected directly and indirectly by the Malaysian Airlines, it's only correct that we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a miracle and Allah grant by His will, may He grant sabr to those who have been affected. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Brothers and sisters, back to basics. If we take a look at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where the people were involved in much ignorance. They were doing things which were absolutely barbaric and engaged in that which did not make sense. People worshipped sticks and stones and they worshipped other people. There were hierarchies in society and community. And at the same time, those who had a high standing position got away with murder. And those who were of a lower standing in society, they were always penalized and sometimes made to be scapegoats. If we take a look at what happened to women, for example, at that particular time, they were traded, they were considered as a commodity, they were not allowed to inherit, they had no right to own anything. They were given to those who were owed money and they were of those who had no position in society, nothing at all, a pastime, amusement, sex objects and so on. And then you take a look at what happened. Allah has blessed us and Allah blessed us in so many different ways. لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Allah says, indeed, Allah has favored the believers when He sent to them from amongst them a messenger who read the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He who reads the recitation or the revelation and he who cleanses, purifies them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it very clear that this was a gift of Allah upon the mu'mineen, those prepared to believe in the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he taught them the revelation and the wisdom divided into two things. Revelation meaning that which your maker and mine has sent down as a word that is sacred. It will never change and it will be valid until the end of time. We need to remember this. And secondly, the term wisdom would also refer to the entire lifestyle of the man who brought that message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whose name is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. So Allah says, these people were astray before. Before revelation, they were astray. Before believing, they were astray. The same would apply to us. Before believing, we are astray or we were astray. And we will only be rightly guided for the amount that we are prepared to surrender to what Allah has just made mention of in this beautiful verse. If you are prepared to surrender yourself to Al-Kitab Wal-Hikmah, that is when you will be able to be rightly guided. And so will I. And the more we have turned away from it, the more we will be misguided. Even though we might think we are sharp, we are intelligent, 
But if you take a careful look, you will come to understand that the maker of every one of us knows better how our system operates, where we were, where we are, where we are heading. So what took them out of their misguidance? What took them out of their misguidance? It was the gift of Allah that took them out of their misguidance. It is Allah who chooses who will be rightly guided and who will not. He has put within our capacity the ability to strive towards achieving guidance, but ultimately He is the owner of guidance. This is why Allah says very clearly in the opening surah of the Quran, and we repeat this so many times a day. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمَ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ You alone we worship, you alone we ask for help. That is point number one. We worship Allah alone and we will seek help from Him in a way that He has condoned and He has taught. And then we continue to say, guide us to the straight path. After having confirmed that we worship Allah alone, we will do nothing to displease our maker. Then we say, oh Allah, keep us steadfast on that path. The path of worshipping you alone, the path that will please you, keep us steadfast on the path, the straight path, the path of those whom you have favoured, the path of those whom you have favoured, those who have believed, those whom you have been kind to, kind enough to, to guide them, to show them where they were, where they are and where they are heading, so that they prepare for the future, the real future. In life today, we prepare for the future, but sometimes it is the fake future. Do you know what that means? That means I go to school and I learn so much and I have memorized all the books and I get a certificate and I graduate and I go to university and I become something. And if you are to be asked or if you ask me, why did you do that? Perhaps the answer would be from the most of the people on the globe that I need a life. I need to get married. I need to have children. I need to have a salary. I need to have a house and I need to have a car and I need to be able to afford life. And then I need to afford a holiday or two as well then then I need to invest so that when I die my children will be okay my brother when you die will you be okay that's the question you see the deception one is we are not saying it's wrong to study and to prepare for the temporary future it's not wrong but not at the expense of the real everlasting future we are guilty a lot of us of saying that I would like to set my children in a way that when I die, they are okay. Forgetting that really we need to be asking ourselves when I die, will I be okay? If we have lived up to then we will be okay. If we lived up to that sirat and we look for it and we make sure that we try our best to tread upon it, then we will be okay. Then by the will of Allah, He will assist us. And this is why He says in so many different places in the Quran regarding the true believers that for them shall be paradise. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَوُوا الزَّكَاةَ لَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Indeed, those who believe and do good deeds and establish prayer and give charities, reach out to others with arms to the poor and the needy and so on, for them there is no need to fear, there is no need to worry. They will have their reward with their Rabb, with their Maker. Their reward is with their Maker. 
they have no need to fear or worry, no sadness. They will never be sad. Why? Because they have invested in the right thing. They have gone back to the basics to look at what it was that took those people out of the darkness and brought them to the light. We need to understand we must go back to see exactly what it was that took them out of the darkness. And let's be careful not to return to a new type of darkness. This is why Allah says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ الْأُولَىٰ In Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah addressing the wives of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and by extension, the lesson is for us all, the females of today as well. Where Allah addresses the wives of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asks them to be indoors and asks them not to go back to what is known as tabarruj. Tabarruj, perhaps to dress for others. This is what happens. To beautify ourselves for those whom we are not supposed to be beautifying ourselves for. And to try and lure and attract those whom we are not supposed to be doing it to something important. So Allah says, don't go back to the ignorance, the tabarruj of the first ignorant period. There are different translations as to what exactly the first ignorant period is referring to. But what we do know, there was a time when people were in ignorance. So your dress code took you out of that period of darkness and brought you into the period of light and gave you the respect that you deserve. Do not go back to being the sex object that you were a long time ago. Do not go back to being a person who did not prepare for the day they were going to meet their maker for the ultimate life that would be everlasting. Do not be the person of the past who was astray to the degree that they drank all weekend and they partied every Friday night and Saturday night and even sometimes partying on a Sunday night to the degree that Monday morning they are half awake and half asleep. Subhanallah. May Allah protect us. Is that what life is? We earn, we spend, we enjoy. We earn, we spend, we enjoy. When we die, people who don't have knowledge will say, what a great achievement this man or this woman has achieved. They really enjoyed their lives. They lived up to the age of 90. They had a lot of fun and they amassed a lot of wealth. But did the person ever call out to the one whom they will now go to forever? This is why the period of time I shall spend underground when I am buried will be far longer than the period of time that I would have ever spent above the ground. Remember that. If I am given a good life, perhaps 70, perhaps 80, how much more would I want? Perhaps 90, then perhaps 100. Let's clock the century, mashallah. With all the 2020 going on across the globe and the cricket, when you say clocking a century, they get excited. Even if you give them the century, that does not mean they won the match. Allahu Akbar. Does not mean that they won the match. No. But in reality, even if I was given a hundred years, I will only be a winner by one system, one plan. There is only one way of achieving that win. And that is, develop your link with he whom you are going to return to. And remember one thing, the rest of us need exactly the same thing. The rest of us need exactly the same thing. I need it as desperately as you do. So if you were to think that I am the one who is going to result in your paradise because I have a contact, you must remember there is no corruption on that day. No. In this world, you might have a traffic fine. You might want to jump a queue. You might have something you'd like to really bypass and do because you know someone. In this world, you may achieve that. That does not work in the life after death. People are equal like the teeth of a comb in so many different ways. Subhanallah. I need Allah as desperately as you do. Yes, Allah would use some of us to guide the others. That would be a reward for us who have made an effort and a reward even for those who have been guided. If I was guided through the effort of someone, Allah will reward them for their effort. 
and make it more easy for them if he knows the sincerity levels and whatever else the person had in terms of goodness then Allah will grant them the reward and make it easy for them to earn paradise but they would require and need paradise in the same way that I do subhanallah the same way that I do. And from this we learn that shaitan comes to us to contaminate. Don't forget that. Don't ever forget that. When we return this evening, we go to our homes, we should ponder over that term. Why do we repeat it so often? Because that is the basic tenet of Islam. That is the prime teaching of Islam. It is what removed the people from worshipping people to worshipping the Lord of all the people. Subhanallah. It is what removed the people from worshipping sticks and stones and material items of value of the dunya to worshipping that which is of value of the akhirah. Allahu Akbar. Something very important. People do not like to be told sometimes because they are living in a comfort zone. Comfort zone. So when we remind each other, people get upset. They say, but I am worshipping Allah alone. So this is why we say, don't forget shaitan's plan. He comes to try and return us back to the first period of ignorance, but in a smart way, through your smartphone and through your technology and your Wi-Fi and so on. I remember the last time one of the youngsters asked me a question and he told me, if shaitan was kicked out of heaven, how did he affect Adam? May peace be upon him. If shaitan was kicked out of heaven, how did he affect Adam? I told him, and this was recently, I said, turn on your phone. He turned it on. I said, turn on your Wi-Fi. He turned it on. I said, what do you see? He said, there are so many different Wi-Fi's that are available for me to connect on. I said, do you see them? He says, no. I said, okay, now turn off your phone. The example I'm about to give is very different from a phone, but in the same way you can receive data and you can receive messages without seeing the person or being near them. You can receive a strong broadband internet connection without seeing your photo flying in the air. Imagine if our photographs had to fly in the air, perhaps we would not send them because we would be too embarrassed that they might be intercepted by others. Subhanallah, they are encrypted and sent through the air. When you breathe the last time, did you breathe somebody's photograph? Subhanallah. I took a deep breath, but I didn't breathe any of your messages. No. But the same way we need to understand, Allah knows how shaitan did it. And this is why he says that, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا الشَّيَاطِينَ أَوْلِيَاءَ لِلَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Shaitan sees you. Him and his group, they see you from a position that you do not see them. So they attack you through your thoughts and they are the ones who give the false comfort to those who disbelieve. They are the ones who give the false sense of security to those who disbelieve. Amazing. Look at the verse. Allah says they give the false sense of security to those who disbelieve. Are we disbelievers? May Allah protect us. But on the other side of the coin, are we people who have a false sense of security? If that is the case, strengthen your iman. Strengthen your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go back to Iyyaka na'budu wa Iyyaka nasta'in. Allahu Akbar. Go back to that and ask yourself, am I worshipping Allah? Am I worshipping Him alone? Do I receive my education from a trustable source when it comes to my link with Allah or am I worshipping the one who has come to me with the message imagine you know I, and I like to give this example I might have given it before but I will repeat it by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the best of creation is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without a doubt the highest in rank of all the messengers Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the one whom we hope for and pray for his intercession on the day of judgment Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he has such a privilege and such an honor we we acknowledge it and we will only be considered believers if we acknowledge that Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
Amongst us are people who try to deliver the good message. We will respect them, we will honor them, and we will understand that they have perhaps been chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring the message to us. And we will understand they are human beings, they may err, they may make an error. So what would happen? Because they are human and because they may make an error, everything they say, we have to test it to see if it passes a certain test. No matter what is being said, whether I say it or anyone else says it, if it is to do with your faith and your preparation for the life after death, there is a test. You test the words that the person is uttering. Do they conform to revelation or not? As simple as that. If they do, we take them because that will be the true preparation for the day we die. If they don't, we do not need them to say the minimum. This is why when a person associates a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, say for example, I am calling out to Allah alone and I am asking Allah alone and so on. Then comes a man and he says, I can help you. I can assist you. I can tell you so many things about your life and I will tell you what to do. And if he comes and tell us that which is in total disagreement with what Allah has revealed and if we are to still accept it then we have associated that person as a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then do you know what Allah says in a hadith Qudsi he says Ana aghna shurakai ani shirki man amila amalan ashraka fihi ma'ya ghayri taraktuhu wa shirka when, we, when there is a partnership, I am the one who does not need that partnership. So whoever wants to engage in such partnership between me and someone else, I withdraw and I leave the two of them to do their thing. This is Allah's plan. So it's very important. Keep on calling out to Allah. Someone asked me a few days ago that if I am possessed by the devil, Surely I can go and do those 80 lemons and those 100 rose petals and I can run around the, 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 uh, you know, the four-way street naked at 12 o'clock midnight in order to be cured because I am possessed. What other way is there of doing it? So immediately I said, my brother, something very important you need to know. Allah has a way and a system that he has taught for us to achieve and receive cure from our sickness and possession. And that is through permissible means. You either seek medication or you continue reciting the Quran and make sure that you do it through the Quran and the Sunnah. And although the process might be a little bit slower, but Allah knows why he has kept you in that condition for a longer period of time when a man would like to become rich again you may have heard this before he can either work very hard and after 20 years he sees wealth or he can go and steal and through corruption he can have millions overnight but those millions overnight will never bring happiness to him they will bring about destruction they will bring about that which will really make him depressed but he has the millions. And this is why I always laugh when I see people winning the lottery and they say 100 million won by so and so. And I just say, let him go and read the statistics of those who have won similar amounts in the past. See what has happened to them within a short space of time. They lost their health, they lost their lives, they lost their families and they are totally depressed and they have no wealth in most cases. Go and search it. It's on the internet. Subhanallah. So, if we are sick and ill, one of the ways of achieving that cure is going via the devil. We will still be cured. We will still be given perhaps that cure, maybe even quicker. But we have stolen it. We have done the wrong thing. Never use the excuse of wanting something desperately to lead you to that which displeases Allah. No, because then you fail your test. Subhanallah, it's like I am telling you, this is a mathematics test, you are not allowed calculators. So it will take you a little bit longer to work things out, but you become a person who does things correctly. But then comes a person who says, no, whilst they are not watching, let me quickly use my calculator. And if they use their calculator, they will fail the exam, although the answer was correct.
You see? Although the answer was valid and they got it in no time, but you had to take your time to work out the sum. Some of us, when we don't have wealth, when we are tested by Allah in sickness, when certain things happen to us, we want to use calculators when Allah has told us not to for that examination. It's just a metaphorical example. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. May He open our doors. So we go back to exactly what brought them out. It was a Adopting what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with to the T. Everything he brought, they considered it a gift. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he has declared the basics, we're talking about going back to the basics. He has declared the basics. And he has shown us the path of happiness of the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did they achieve it? Well, listen to one of the verses of Surah Al-Ahzab. Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَارَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا It is not befitting for a believing male or female that when Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have declared something, decreed something, issued an instruction that they feel within their hearts that they have a choice in this regard. The, a true believer, male or female, would believe that they have no choice in this regard. That is the meaning of the term Islam and Iman. To surrender and to believe. And Allah says, Whoever goes against or transgresses or sins against the instruction of Allah and His Messenger, they have indeed gone astray in a very manifest, clear way. They are far astray. May Allah protect us from being astray. So that is what brought them out of their darkness. And that those were the basics at the time that that goodness was based upon. Like I said, there are new ways of deviation where people still think that, you know what? I can change what was there at the time in terms of worship. Remember, when it comes to worship, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the famous declaration. Famous declaration. What is the declaration? He said, Man amila amalan. لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا فَهُوَ رَدْ Powerful words. The declaration. Whoever engages in any act of worship that we have not instructed, it shall return to them in sin and in evil. Allahu Akbar. It will go back to them. It will rebound to them. Which means, the people at the time did not know how to worship Allah. Not at all. They had no clue. So Allah sent a gift of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the people in order to teach them how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when he came, he taught them, okay, you will do salah in this way. You will give alms to the poor in this way. Your declaration of faith will be in this way. You will fast during the month of Ramadan in this way. And you will go for Hajj in this particular way. These are five pillars, the basics. Can I say I'm going for Hajj to Disneyland? Little children might say, yes, yes. That is not Hajj. Hajj needs to be at a specific place, at a specific time, in a specific way. I cannot claim that I am going for Hajj, but because I have 50 million ringgit in my account, my ihram is going to be a suit. Can I say that? You will wear exact regard. It was something else. It's the same applies to fasting. Allahu Akbar. May Allah protect us. If you think you can fast at your own time, it's not fasting. You have to do it exactly how it was taught. You know, some people fast and they think, you know, perhaps one day there will be a certain type of food that we just breathe. 
and we will be able to not feel the fast. We will be able to perhaps become full through the day. No, it's quite easy. You get used to it by the will of Allah. People in Europe at the moment are fasting for perhaps 17, 18 hours in the month of Ramadan. And they tell you the same fast outside Ramadan, we feel it very difficult. But once it comes into Ramadan, we have belief, we have Iman, and it's coming from your maker. It's made easy. Very easy by the will of Allah. This is why, you know, some people who have missed their fast due for sickness or other reasons, when they are making it up after Ramadan, they always say, it's quite difficult. It's not as easy. Subhanallah. Amazing. Why? Because it is the blessing that Allah has kept in that month of Ramadan. May he make it easy for us. So we have to do it exactly how the messenger has taught. And we have to understand and realize that from the very beginning, humbleness was always a sign of belief and closeness to Allah. A person who is humble, that was the sign that they are close to Allah. It was one of the main signs. So if you have a person who fulfills their prayer five times a day, who engages in perhaps fasting so many times a week and who does uh, lots of charitable activity and who goes for Hajj and Umrah as much as they can and they are constantly engaging in dhikr and so on. To be honest, if their attitude stinks, they cannot be close to Allah. All this is a show. It's a show. That's what it is. You develop your attitude. That's the basics. You understand that the rest of mankind are your brothers and sisters in humanity who are also desperately in need of the guidance. So you will use every capacity of yours to try to convince them regarding what the goodness is, bearing in mind that the most powerful way of inviting those who have not seen the light to the light is by living upon the light. The most powerful way of inviting those who have not seen the light to the light is by living upon the light. By living upon the goodness of the deen, will others be able to see that this is a beautiful deen. But the minute we develop an attitude and we have this arrogance and we become people who bad mouth others and we swear others and we do not respect the rest of humanity, what will happen? Immediately we find people having the wrong picture of who we are and worse than that having the wrong picture of who Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was solely because we have led a barbaric life may Allah forgive us so it's important to go back to the original teachings of goodness and that is impossible unless we learn the deen many times we claim to love the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam yet we have not even studied the in-depth biography of his and we don't even know the details of his character and conduct the way he treated the non-muslims who had harmed him physically and personally he always maintained hope that they will turn towards the goodness instead of away from it he always maintained hope no matter who it was take a look at Abu Jahl who was known as one of the main enemies of Islam what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam did he called out to Allah oh Allah guide this man to the goodness oh Allah bring this man forth to the goodness oh Allah let him see the light and in one occasion he says oh Allah grant strength to the deen through the Iman or the acceptance of the faith by one of these two powerful men, either Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu later to be known as, or Amr ibn Hisham who was Abu Jahl. With us, we have a small problem with another Muslim brother or sister. We start cursing them. Oh Allah, destroy this man. Oh Allah, destroy this sister. Oh Allah, fix them up. Allahu Akbar, whoa. Whoa. And that is your brother in Deen. We have two differences of opinion or five differences of opinion amongst us and we are cursing each other. Oh Allah, destroy them. Oh Allah, break their bones. Oh Allah, grant them. And you don't know they are sitting at the same time praying for your bones to be broken. <laughs> is that a Muslim? Is that going back to basics? Is that what we were taught? Is that what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa did? 
Is that what he taught? Is that what he stood for? Is that the Islam that we are promoting? Really? That is ignorance of the highest degree. It shows we have no link with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam's life. We probably don't even know what he would have done in that situation. May Allah protect us. This is why there is a powerful dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made mention of in the Quran. رَبَّنَا غُفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ The true believers, they continue praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, O oh our Lord, forgive us. And forgive our brothers who have preceded us in this faith and do not keep in our hearts any ill feeling, any grudge, any negative feeling towards those who have believed. Don't keep that ill feeling and grudge towards those who have believed. We are brothers and sisters in the deen and the rest are our brothers and sisters in humanity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us distinguish between the two to understand the rights of both. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us to spread the goodness. My brothers and sisters, it is important that we go back to the basics because there are people today who are trying to hijack the deen in order to promote it as a barbaric religion that teaches the killing of innocent people wherever they are instead of teaching them the goodness of the faith. This is something that needs to be spoken about. If someone, for example, does not believe in the same thing you believe in, you need to look at them as a client, as a customer, as a, as a potential Muslim, someone you can go to and showcase the deen and market the product known as the deen to them, rather than imagine you're standing at a huge supermarket of your own and every customer that comes in, you kill him. <laughs> when are you going to make business? Every customer, that man, the other one. Foolish, the man needs mental help. The same thing applies, we have the deen. Those who are outside the door, they are clients coming in, subhanallah. We want to attract them through leaflets and CDs and DVDs and videos and everything else and talk to them and try and, and we need to showcase. For example, a man who wants everyone to believe that the Lexus 600 hybrid is the best vehicle on earth or let's give you another example, the Mercedes Benz maybe, Allah knows best. If you would like to market that as the best vehicle on earth, when you are driving it, you need to make sure that people see how comfortable you are. And you're just sitting and cruising in your vehicle. The other people say, wow, I need one like this. It looks lovely, man. You are marketing the product. We are good at marketing items of material value. Why don't we market the deen? That is the basics. Go back to it. Market the deen. When people see you, they see a calmness in your face. They know you've been through difficulty. You have health issues. You've lost family members. They know that you are struggling financially, but you are so happy. When you get up for salah, you just raise your hands and you are so calm. When they look at you, they know deep down there is a driving force behind the contentment. And that is the link this person has with his or her maker. Remember that. You want contentment? If you want it, develop your link with the one who made you the owner of contentment. He owns it. Subhanallah. It's amazing. So this is Allah. He has given us all the ingredients. The problem with us, sometimes we don't even know the ingredients and sometimes they are right in front of us and we are too lazy to make an effort to get hold of them and to make use of them. So remember, we go back to the basics. How many of us we would like a lot of goodness. We want to see ourselves happy. But I promise you, Salatul Fajr, we could not be bothered. Could not be bothered. No bother. Someone says, but what about Subh? Salatul Subh, Salatul Fajr. And we say, I heard the Shaykh saying, in Allah Ghafoorul Rahim. You know, I needed to sleep. Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. <laughs> Who are we talking to? Little children? Make an effort to get up. It might be your last salah. I recall a story of a man recently who asked Allah's forgiveness and 
he was in the mataf in Mecca, which was quite full. And he decided to go into what is known as the hijr, the little tricircular, or should I say the little semicircular part of the Kaaba. In it is considered as inside the Kaaba. And he went in there to read two raka'at of salah after having led a life full of, you know, sin. And he comes there and in sujood he passed away. In sujood, this is a true story very recently. In sujood he passed away. And the shaykh who was with him was actually shocked because just before that he was talking about how he has turned to Allah just now he says I have chosen to turn to Allah and that's it I nothing is going to deter me from my link with my maker and he passed away now the question is sometimes Allah has written for us to pass away at a certain time of the day, every one of us is going to go. I always ask Allah, Ya Allah, I ask you to grant me a good death. May Allah grant it to all of us. Now don't go home and say we were praying to die. <laughs> Allahu Akbar, because it happened once. One youngster came to me and said, Hey, but Sheikh, every time you make a dua to die. I said, no, we ask Allah for a good death. We ask Allah for a good death. There is a difference. We want to lead this life for as long as we know, inshallah, we will be able to continue earning reward for Allah subhanahu, for our sake and our link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we ask Allah, Allahumma inna nas'aluka husnul khatima. Oh Allah, we ask you for what is known as husnul khatima. The last days should be the best. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, Allahumma ja'al khayra ayyamina awakhiraha wa khayra a'malina khawakhiraha. Oh Allah, let the best of our days be the last days. And let the best of our deeds be the last final closing deeds. So if Allah has written your death at the time of Fajr, and you are busy in bed, for example, sleeping, dreaming, what would happen? You might have been awake in Salah and you would have been taken away. The best thing for you to have done, get up and fulfill it. Don't be lazy. So one of the basics of Islam is to fight laziness. There is no room for laziness in Islam. And there is no room for saying, tomorrow I will turn to Allah. That word tomorrow means too late. I need to turn now. If I want to make big decisions, make them now. And if you take a look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will find that at his time they laughed at those who followed the deen. Up to today they will laugh at those who followed the deen. You will find at that time, if you go back to what happened there, you will know that family members made it tough for those who accepted the deen to live upon it. The same applies today, where family members make it tough for those who want to put on a scarf as well, and they say that they make their life rough and tough. That is the jahiliya, that is the period of ignorance, and sometimes community makes it semi-impossible for people to live with ease in the fold of Islam if they have reverted to the deed. Just today, I got a message of someone who wanted to be with us this evening, but their family members blocked them and stopped them because they said, no way, you are not going to go to those Muslimin, may Allah protect us. And these people are non-Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand that the gift we are upon is such that if they knew the goodness we are on, they would be here first, you know? When I was in Hajj in 1996, there was a fire in Arafah, sorry, in Mina, there was a fire and the tents were being burnt and I was passing in the morning and I heard one of the policemen on their walkie talkies on their little radio systems being instructed to empty out the whole of Mina and I was shocked and this policeman was asking a question, are you sure? And the instruction was coming from the top to say empty out the whole of Mina. And I happened to hear this, so I went back into my tent. And I told the people that look, I heard an instruction, empty out the whole of Mina because the fire has started on one end and the wind is blowing and the gas canisters are bursting and it's coming very fast up to the top. So I remember clearly there was a man who said, He's talking nonsense, make dua, Allah is the greatest, the fire will not come here. Did you hear that? So I got up with respect and I was still a young person, student, and I said, you know, we make dua, but with the dua, we need to walk out as well. 
Really? I cannot insult Allah to say, Allah, I'm, I'm doing dua, help me. You know, today we have a beautiful venue. There was a big effort put into this. I'm sure the brothers did not just sit and say, Ya Allah, let it happen. Ya Allah, let the light come. Yeah. But we say, Bismillah, in the name of Allah. Ya Allah, give us the courage, the power, the ability, and so on, and accept it from us. Then we start in the name of Allah. And that is the achievement. So later on, I decided to create a little flag, we put up a pole and a piece of cloth at the top for the people of the tent to know that we are walking in this direction because we were belonging to one tent and we are walking towards Makkah or at least towards Aziziyah, which is just outside Mina. And you know what happened? About one hour later, the same man who was telling everyone to sit and relax and read dua, I saw him in front of me. And I looked at him and I said, Subhanallah, he understood the value of the statement I made. Now the reason why I'm saying this is, there are people sometimes who don't know the value of the deen of Islam, but had they known it, they would compete with you regarding the deen. They would be in tahajjud before you, and they would probably be in fajr and read a better salah than all of yours put together. This is why I say, do not underestimate the gift of Allah. There are people out there who will catch us on the day of judgment and say, I interacted with you all your life. Why didn't you introduce me to Allah? So it's our duty from the very beginning. Anni walau ayah, convey from me. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, even if it means a single verse, convey it, give it to others. In what way? Give it to them through your actions and through your words through your character and through your words. So one is to say Islam teaches this, Islam teaches that, and Islam is so good, and Islam teaches good character. But more important than that is to live by it so that people look at you and they say, wow, this is what you get as a Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Really, may He grant us all contentment that we are searching for. May He make us go back to the basics, the basics. So one of the first points that I am mentioning is, how strong are you with your salah? If you are strong with your prayer, the rest of your deen will fall into place by the will of Allah. But if you are weak with your prayer, what do you expect? The main point, everywhere you look in the Quran, وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَارْكَعُوا مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ So many places in the Quran, Allah says, establish your prayer, give alms to the poor, find yourselves praying with those who are praying, bowing, prostrating with those who are bowing, prostrating, and so on. So many different places in the Quran. The issue of salah, so important. Whereas when we don't read it, what happens? We want to call ourselves good Muslim. I'm a good Muslim, inshallah. You know, alhamdulillah. I dress in this way. I say, salamu alaikum when I see people. Is that what Islam is? I just say, salamu alaikum. Do you know the term salamu alaikum? As-salamu alaikum means, may peace be upon you. In other words, I will not harm you to start with and I pray that there is peace upon you from every other direction. There you are. But the hypocritical behavior of today, as you and I know it, Salam Alaikum, Salam Alaikum. And as soon as they move, mm, that sister, you know, that woman, dangerous, poisonous, watch out, watch out. I'm saying it in a Malaysian accent so you understand. Poisonous. Watch out, careful. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. In fact, I heard a new one. I, can I tell it to you? MashaAllah. Poisonous la. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors, to grant us ease. That is hypocritical behavior because why are you greeting them with such a powerful dua when you are lying? You'd rather say assalamu alaikum and make dua, Ya Allah, help her, help me. Ya Allah, whatever has happened between us, resolve, help it solve and so on. And do something about it. Say, my sister, I'm so sorry. You know, we have a misunderstanding. I really hope that you don't hold it against me. I didn't mean it. Don't worry. Please forgive me. 
and I've forgiven you and so on. And you know, one day I, I met a brother and I told him, uh, just being uh, polite, I said, brother, you know what, uh, there seems to be a little bit of a misunderstanding between us. You know, forgive me, please. And you know, I forgive you. He says, what are you forgiving me for? What did I do? I said, uh oh, we've got to a new level now, new level. <laughs> I was meaning it in a good way to say, let's clear the record. If anything, I was hurt, I forgive you. He says, you don't need to forgive me because I didn't do anything wrong. Going back to understanding that sometimes we hurt people without realizing we've hurt them. Sometimes we do things bad to people without realizing that we have. Clear the record. You ask for forgiveness and forgive them too. Subhanallah. And make sure that we make this forgiveness something open so that Allah will forgive us as well. Look at Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu. When he forgave Mistah ibn Athatha radiallahu anhu after the accusation of against his own daughter Aisha radiallahu anha, you know what had happened. And he forgave him with such a big heart by the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was so happy even after that, he developed a good link with this man. Amazing. Who would do that? Today we fly out accusations like a little, you know, fly coming out of our mouths. Shoo, it's out. Where did it go? Well, it sat somewhere and it sat here. It comes out of our mouths. Subhanallah. Accusation after accusation, statement after statement. So we become engrossed in the lives of others in such a way that we've stopped leading our own lives. My life came to a standstill by you talking about how badly others are driving. It's not going to improve your driving. Remember that you need your lessons. You need to drive on. You need to make sure you are the one who is polite. You need to make sure you drive correctly and you make an effort to improve. That will improve. You are courteous on the roads. You know, I was in London a few days ago and something very strange happens there. Different parts of the country, there are different levels of politeness when it comes to the road. So in London itself, sometimes you find people might be less patient. So if you are waiting, some of them might let you go after about five cars, someone will flash and you continue. You know, they are courteous. They let you in, they let you go. They might wait for a second and let you go through. But the minute you travel a little bit up to some of the different areas, some of the people, subhanallah, so polite. They will stop and wait one car, two cars, three cars, four cars, five cars. And the people at the back, if they were in my country, they would probably be hooting madly. Hey, carry on. What are you waiting for everyone else for? And I'm thinking, look at how disciplined these people are. They are teaching me a little bit of supper, subhanallah. We don't even have patience with our fellow believers and our children, parents, family members, husbands, wives, in-laws, and what have you. We don't even have five minutes of patience with them. Subhanallah. This is why one of the basic teachings of Islam is to work on yourself and to work on people that you interact with. Work on them. And working on them means it will take you years to improve a relationship. Don't just suddenly jump in and out of a relationship. You get married today and tomorrow it's over. And the following day you, you are not changing motor vehicles, my sister. No, these are human beings. You need to understand you in something, you will be tested. And part of the test is it will take you time. Look at the lives of others. They will tell you when we started off, we were worse than you. Today, eight years down the line of a lot of patience and wisdom and tact and so much of give and take, we are the happiest couple we could ever be. It has happened and it continues to happen. But if you're not ready to make an effort, forget about being happy. Forget about being content because no matter what you will have, you will always be a person who's not happy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us happiness. So inshallah, we will be all fulfilling our salah. Am I correct? We will be always fulfilling our salah. And that inshallah should be yes, inshallah. Don't just say inshallah. As you know, sometimes you tell someone, are you coming to my house? Inshallah. <laughs> that means no, I won't. It's the way we say it. But if someone says, are you coming to my house? Inshallah, I will be there. Inshallah, I will be there. And you, you can tell from the enthusiasm that they are serious. So inshallah, we'll be fulfilling our salah. Yeah. 
inshallah that looks more inshallah enthusiastic by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my brothers and sisters that is one of the things we need to understand and realize the fulfillment of the arms to the poor, the fulfillment of our fasting for the sake of Allah, the fulfillment of our journey for Hajj and so on. These are part of the basic teachings of Islam. And then we have something that is mentioned in the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, when he once came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the presence of the companions and they looked at him, they did not recognize him. They just saw a man, very good looking, he had black hair and he had white clothing and he did not look very tired, nobody knew him. And what happened? He sat right in front of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in such a way that his knees were almost touching Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam's knees. They had got together and he says, tell me, what is Islam? So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded, Al-Islam, Shahadatu an la ilaha illa Allah wa anni rasulullah wa iqami salati wa ita'i zakati wa sawmi ramadhan wa hajji al-bayt man istata'a ilayhi sabila. Five pillars, you know them? We all know them off by heart, but to live by them is not a joke. To live by them is something serious. I believe in Allah. What does that mean? That means I worship Him alone. He is my maker. When I put my head on the ground, I know that this is for the one who made me. That's it. Nobody else is owed that. That is part of believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I've uttered it with my tongue, whether or not I've lived by it, that is a whole lifespan. It's a whole lifespan. So, shahada. To bear witness, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger, which means he came with the message. Have you ever sat and thought, what's the meaning of messenger? We always say the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Have you sat and thought, what does it mean? What is a messenger? A messenger is one who carries the message from one to another. That is a messenger. So he carried the message. The message came through him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you consider that as the message? Is that the message? And if you did, did you read your message? Do you know the message was for you? Have you read your message? Allahu Akbar. I just thought of an example. Imagine you have a WhatsApp message. Beep, beep. WhatsApp. And after a little while, another one, and a third one, and a fourth one. And then you look at the phone, like I looked at my phone this afternoon, 328 unread messages. Whoa. Where do you start? Well, then you get to a level where you search for your loved ones. So what happens is you press the little magnifying search and you press a name of a person whom you'd like to see what they've said. That's what happens because you need to prioritize due to your timing. Then you get someone bombarding you telling me that you know what? You're online, but you haven't replied me. Relax. If you knew what I'm going through now, Perhaps you would realize that, you know what, I'm just a human being, a mere mortal whose capacity is extremely limited. So don't hold it against me. But if you reply to them, your time will be up. So just ignore that for now. Ignore it for now. But imagine with us, it happens with me as well. If I know that my phone has been beeping one after the other and a third and a fourth, I am somehow really so much looking forward to seeing what is that message. I really feel, when will I see what, what it is? It must be something important, you know? It must be something serious. Imagine you have a phone and 20, 30 messages showing, beeping, waiting. And you know, sometimes the light flashes depending on how you've set it and it keeps on flashing. Your messages from someone important, you will immediately take your phone, your heart is beating, hoping that it's something good. And then you read, you are invited to a wedding tomorrow. Oh, wow, yeah. beautiful, mashallah, alhamdulillah. Allah grant barakah to all those coming through, alhamdulillah. Allah grant barakah to all those who are married. Allah bless them with offspring who will be the coolness of their eyes. And Allah grant them goodness in their marriages. And those who are not married, Allah grant them spouses who will be the coolness of their eyes. You see the men, they don't like to say Ameen so loudly. Have you noticed? <laughs> That's a problem. The minute I say, may Allah give you another wife and a third one and a fourth one, Ameen! Loud! 
My brother, you haven't yet started with one. You haven't even lived correctly with the one. So come on, take it easy, you know? Like I normally say, you don't know how to drive a vehicle and you want to own four of them. Allahu Akbar, may Allah protect us. May Allah grant us ease. But the point being made is that you get the message, you want to read it, you will make sure that you read it. And you will make sure when it is someone important that you reply, you acknowledge and so on. But you have a message that you still haven't read from the most important person in your life. Who is he? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, he, he brought the message. He delivered it. Subhanallah, delivered. You see two ticks, delivered, done. Believe me, but you have not made the effort to open it and read it every day. The amazing Quran, read it. Subhanallah, your message, two ticks, it's given to you, not once. You have so many copies of the message all over. Every phone of yours has the message, but you haven't read it. That is the basic message of the deen. We haven't read it. And he is the most important person. None of you are true believers until he or she loves me. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says more than his own child and his own parent and all the other people. He comes first. Subhanallah. But I haven't read his message. I'm still holding it. It's still in my, you know, on my phone. Do you know what? When I sit and think of technology, I feel like crying to say, Ya Allah, you've made it so easy for us. We're still lazy. Do you know we are sitting here a few thousand people perhaps? I, can I tell you something? We probably have as many Qur'ans with us. In our phones, and with us and around us and the Huffar and so many different ways we have this message with us almost all of us if not all not at home right here with us and right now it's the press of two or three buttons and you'll be able to read that message but we've become so lazy that we are so happy I remember a young man telling me, what's the best app, the best app to read the translation of the Quran. So I told him, according to me, it is this one and so on. I, I believe the Sahih international translation of the Quran is very easy to follow. It, the language is not difficult. And I have a habit when you talk, use the simplest language so that those who might, you know, feel or who might not be linguistically so high, at least they will understand what you're saying. Simple language. So I believe that's a good translation. I met him sometime later. I told him, did you download it? He said, I downloaded it straight away. Have you read it? <laughs> Not yet la. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. May Allah protect us. May Allah grant us ease. What's the point? Not yet. Allahu Akbar. Allahu. Really? What was the point of asking and finding out when you haven't made the effort? So I call on you all and myself. Spend the time every day, even if it is a few moments. Read that message, the original message of the Quran. Go back to it, see it, try and understand it. Ask questions to those with knowledge if you have not comprehended the translation here and there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our knowledge. Brothers and sisters, these are just some of the basics. The message that came, it came, it is valid up to the end. We have it, it is in our midst. The problem is we've become lazy to read it. We've become lazy to go by it. It has in it the solutions to everything that we face and we go through. The problem is we don't want to act upon it as well. Sometimes we know things. I want to end off by saying something very important. Everyone has some form of a problem or difficulty or issue in life. Every single human being. That's the plan of Allah. Nobody can say, I've got no problem whatsoever. There has to be something. Some are big, some are small. But even if it is small, it's still there. I want to tell you, the solution to anything you are going through lies in developing your link with Allah, worshipping Him alone, crying out to Him alone, understanding why you were made, where you are going. Once you know that, you recline everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he lost his son Ibrahim. What did he say? He says, Inna lillahi ma akhada wa lahu ma a'ta wa kullu shay'in indahu bi ajalim musamma. Indeed, to Allah belongs that which he has taken away. It was always his. And for him is that which he gave me in the first place. What I have belongs to Allah. What he took away, it was always his. Subhanallah. And every single thing comes with a fixed time. In our language, expiry date. Do you know when you go to the supermarket and you want to buy some fruit juice or something, what do you look at? Well, I hope you look at the expiry date. The expiry date. I had a friend who only used to buy recently expired items. And I told him why. He said, because it's on sale. I said, okay. Then he tells me, come here. It's not bad. Look what it says. It says best before. It doesn't say worst after. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. And I said, when people want to do things, they continue doing things. But when I have my expiry date and yours, Allah says, Inna ajal Allahi idha jaa la yuakhar lau kuntum ta'lamun. When the prescribed time of Allah comes precisely at that moment, it will happen. No delaying even for a moment. It will not be delayed for a moment if only but you knew. So this is why I say ultimately, I have to return to Allah. Everyone has to return to Allah. The difficulties and issues that I have in this world are so temporary. They are so short lived. So let that not distract you from Allah. Rather use it as a blessing to bring you closer to Allah to study further. Inshallah, we hope to meet again tomorrow. Until then, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.